to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Please worship with us. Do you want to stand? Stand. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory. To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Majesty forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering you saw to
You can grab a seat. As we discussed in our last sermon series, worship is our response to seeing God and hearing his word, for seeing that he is the king of kings who's seated on the throne, and for knowing that he is high and exalted, that worship is our response to who God is, who's initiated towards us. And one of the ways we do that in our worship service is by giving of our tithes and offerings, by giving back to him a portion of what he's given and entrusted to us. And some of the good news about faith in Christ is that when we give, that it isn't to pacify an unruly sovereign, hoping that maybe, maybe, maybe just this will make things go different, but it's an active expression of allegiance, of trust, saying, I have been bought with a price. You paid for it all. And now that I want to show and demonstrate trust of you by offering back to you. And so, yes, we talk about our finances, but this is even our worship services are a place for us to get real about our whole lives of how we're offering them to God. And it's a beautiful thing realizing that we are his. We've been bought with a price. So we're going we're gonna to pray for our offering in a second. Before that, I just wanted to share a short update on our construction. So um, as you probably know, the construction is moving along at the former Atlee Library, new restoration church worship space um, and home base. And uh, we have some pictures that I think are going to come up about what that looks like. Uh, so uh, um, the, there's been heavy construction that started at the beginning of this past week, so that there have been some frames that have been put up in the, the worship space, as well as the hallways of steel frames. You can kind of get a sense of what the, the space is really going to look like. The, 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 uh, the sound wall has been put up between us and Dollar General, uh, because apparently they're really loud on Sunday mornings, and so we're just trying to, anyway, um, just trying to be good neighbors. And anyway, there, there are really exciting things happening at the new space, and so that's this is fun to see. And so we're going to pray that God would continue to move that that along. Uh, so if you could, bow your heads with me, and we will we'll pray for this offering um, as we move into the rest of our worship service. Uh, God, you are the king, the king of all kings, the one who reigns on the throne, who we can trust no matter what. And so we come to you, God, bringing our full selves, asking, God, that you would do work among us. We pray that you would take this offering and multiply it for your kingdom purposes. And not just the kingdom through Restoration Church, but not just the kingdom through Mechanicsville or Virginia, but in the whole world. God, that you would do more with this than we can ask or imagine. Uh, God, we also bring our whole selves to you knowing that, um, that we need to hear from you. And so we pray for those, uh, those of us who are hurting right now and need a word of comfort. We pray for those who don't know where to turn and need direction. We pray for those who maybe this is their, their last step to look for you to speak and pray that you would speak. God, we pray for those um, who have hard hearts right now, that you would soften them. We pray for those who hunger and thirst for food or for your word, that you would fill them. God, we pray for the, um, the impurities and the sin in our hearts that seems like it will never go away, and we ask that you would cleanse and change us. So God, we bring all these things to you, asking that you would meet us, and you promise to in your word by the power of the Holy Spirit. So would you do that in Jesus' name? Now we pray all of this. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God and All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you 
are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God and All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, it's running after me this is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after, it's running after me Your goodness is running after, it's running after me your goodness is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after, it's running after me And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Let's pray uh, God we are here because of your goodness having experienced it before longing to experience it again or maybe for the first time and so pray that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word with joy today we pray this in Christ's name Amen all right, I have a question for you that I want to, uh, to get you to think about. Imagine that this was 2010. Imagine in 2010, I gave you $17. What would you do with it? Besides, you'd probably look at me and strange and say, who is this guy, for one? And two, who gives $17? Now, what if I'd given it to you with a note attached to it? The note said two words, and the two words were this. Buy Tesla. If I had given that to you, you would have gotten one share of Tesla stock um, that has, that since that point, increased roughly 63% year over year, um, and you would have many thousands of dollars. And maybe if you would have taken that seriously, you would have bought lots of shares of Tesla stock, and you can do the math, or at least approximate math in your head, to know that you'd be sitting on a nice pile of cash but you would have had to go through all the ups and downs of being a Tesla investor and all that's associated with that. But you would have had some cash. Now, I wonder if it was me, I think the thing that I would probably feel the most would be, man, I made a good decision. I am smart. I should be a financial planner. Maybe I should tell other people how to invest their money because obviously I'm prescient and I know how to do it. And maybe you would want to do the same thing. Now, on a slightly different level, imagine that you were an early investor, an early investor, an early adopter of the gospel. One of Paul's first converts in a city called Philippi, just across from Turkey in Greece. How would you feel? Would you take the same attitude? Would you also feel like that you needed to tell other people about how they needed to start getting their act together and doing things the right way? Would you feel like you had accomplished something because you were one of the first, because you were on the ground level? We're going to be talking about the letter 
that Paul wrote to these Philippians. And interestingly, he doesn't say, look, you who were the first, you were on top of the world. You can tell the other people what to do. But he said, actually, it's reversed. Is that you who are the first, that it's your chance to serve, to be humble, to follow Jesus, like Chris talked about in the call to worship, who didn't consider, he didn't consider it equality with God, something to be held on to or used for his own advantage, but he took the very nature of a servant. And so there's this whole letter to the Philippians that Paul is calling them to turn everything on their head to take the, life, to take the approach of humility and service and sacrifice in part because they were the first. Now for a third example, what about if you were a charter member of Restoration Church? What position does that put you in? You've invested through lots of challenges. You've persevered through all kinds of things, not to mention the last 13 months, which is incredible that that's where you are. And you have given of your time and talents and treasures for this future that, at least in a physical sense, that we're hoping to realize very soon. And it, it's really, really exciting. And so whether you kind of signed on the dotted line as a charter member or not, that we are part of pre-building restoration. Now, we don't know what these next chapters are going to be like exactly, but I know there's a lot of hope, and there's enthusiasm, and there's joy about what this might be, and the way that we've seen God answer promises so far. But what would your approach be? It's exciting because we're entering into a season that's going to be different after being destabilized by so many things um, and having to switch to Zoom for much is that things are going to be different, that in-person is coming back, that Zoom is hopefully retreating for the most part in the background. And here we are with building permits in hand, construction happening, over 90% funded, and more and more opportunities to see each other face to face and really be the church in each other's lives and in our community. Like, I really think that the best days are ahead of us, and I'm incredibly excited about it all. So now, this is for us a critical time of readiness, of preparing ourselves for that next season, God willing, whenever it's going to start. And so the, what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, actually the next about 10 weeks as we look through this letter to Philippians, is what does it mean to move forward together into this? And this is what the letter to Philippians calls us to. And it's an ancient letter, and as you know, there's written in the first century, but we're going to use it, God willing, to awaken our hearts and to shape our imaginations for what our life together might be like and what it means to move forward into this together. There are rich themes in Philippians. There's humility, courage, knowing Christ above all else, joy in all things. But I think the main message is encapsulated here in verse 127. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. But that's the main message, to stand firm, to strive together as one for the faith of the gospel. And that's what the letter is going to call us to, and that we're going to be talking about ways that we respond to that message together and how we move forward. One of the things that I'm going to ask everyone in our, in our church to do over these next 10 or so weeks as we look into Philippians is take the book of Philippians and read it as many times as you can. That's right, to read it as many times as you can. Once a week would be ideal. And let its message and truth continue to wash over you and shape how you think. So you don't even have to do any fancy study. Just read it. Read it again and again and again and let different parts of it provoke you and prick you and encourage you as God shapes it. So uh, anyway, this is an incredible journey we have, and this is our next phase, and we're going to be moving into it forward together, and so this letter is going to direct us. Now, before we get into the text for today, what I'd like to do is to provide a little context for this letter, because it was an actual letter going to an actual group of people in actual hard circumstances. So what I want us to do is, as we read it, because it isn't just like, hey, it's written to us here today, 2021, that it was written to these people. So we want to understand their context, their life, so we can make the jump from what's happening for them to what's happening for us. Does that make sense? So the way I want to give some background, though, is by doing a, um, I guess, a slightly fictionalized portrayal of a man named Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus was the man who was carrying this letter from Paul, who was in prison, probably in Rome, 
to the Philippians. So he was, he was bringing this letter, and he'd been with Paul in prison. And so I want to kind of give us a picture of what Philippi, a first century Philippi might have been like through the lens. So we don't know a lot about him, but we know the basic contours of his life. So here we go. My name is Epaphroditus. Tomorrow, I'll be back at home in Philippi for the first time in months. It's actually much longer than it was supposed to be. You know, I had I'd been on the road because I'd been given a special honor. Out of all the believers in Philippi, and it, you know, it's just a couple of dozen, really a mustard seed sized amount in a city of tens of thousands. But out of all of us, I was chosen to take our gift to Paul and deliver it to him in prison. He was in prison again. And we were, we were supporting him however we could. And we wanted to tell him that we loved him and that we cared about the gospel going forward, even in prison. And so I was chosen to take this gift and go help meet his needs in prison. Now, while I was there, and you can probably imagine this, knowing that prisons aren't necessarily the cleanest or safest place in the world, I got sick. In fact, I almost died. I didn't feel very brave or helpful to Paul. (laughs) But that guy, he's something else. He never once made me feel like a burden. Instead, he praised me. He commended me for risking my life to do the work of Christ. Man, like that guy, Paul, he talks about some deep stuff. Even after spending some time with him, there's a lot of it. I still don't get. But one thing I know that he's convinced, and skip this, he's convinced that suffering, whether persecution, trials, or even sickness in the line of duty, all of it, all of these things are a witness to Christ. And rather than run from these things, we should receive them as an honor or even a gift. And, and you know, this, that we should think about them as experiences that draw us and others closer to Christ. I felt that. Now, maybe in your day and time, of course, this all makes sense, but not in Philippi. No chance. In our city, everyone is all about honor, status, prestige, looking the right way, being known for doing something great, being a great person. And maybe that that's the focus because of all the ex-military that are here or because of the ways that the opportunities to get Roman citizenship here. But either way, it's the air we breathe, honor, status, reputation. And before Christ, that was me too, of course. I wanted people to know my name, salute me in public, talk about the great things that Epaphroditus had done. And so I strove to look the part, right friends, right clothes, right places, never showing any weakness. But worldly honor, really, can't hold a torch to being honored by God. Now, one day, I heard the gospel. And just, you know, not the gospel of Roman victory promising to bring peace by subjugating others, but the gospel of Jesus, who defeated sin, evil, and death on the cross and rose again the third day, that gospel, the good news that the world was changing, that the things of this world didn't have the last word, but God did. I heard that, and it turned my world upside down. Glory through suffering, honor through humiliation, grace in place of merit, a new family, a new citizenship, a new hope. Now, I know this is really like a Paul thing to say, but it was like scales falling off my eyes for the first time that I saw the world different and true. You know, and since then, and maybe this doesn't surprise you, but since then, my life hasn't been easy. In fact, it's actually been a good bit harder. But all of that former stuff that like, is, is back there in my old life, all that honor-seeking, status, reputation, I just, just labeled it as garbage compared to knowing Christ. Now, Paul lives this too. Several times when I was with him in prison, I saw him wrestling with this situation. In prison, unjustly, for who knows how long. But he continued to come back to the fact that he was in chains for Christ. He was in chains for Christ. That changed everything for him. And every week or so, he'd get the chance to share his testimony with somebody, even some people who were really high up in the whole Roman system. And several began trusting Christ. (laughs) The gospel was going forward even in prison. 
You know, on those nights when we had a new person join our family, man, it was like our meager rations of bread and water become a, became a king's feast because of the joy we had. It was hard for Paul to let me return, but he knew everyone back at home was really worried about me. They'd heard how sick I'd got, plus he really wanted to thank them properly for the gift that he'd received on our behalf. So he sent me. Now, he really loves the churches that he helped start. You know, it's like a parent. He's got unbounded affection, huge joy, and always it seems like he's got just the right thing to say. He just knows just the word to help us take that next step forward. Now, surely you know how the gospel came to us in Philippi, right? Oh, so, so Paul, was, Paul and his companions, they were in kind of modern-day Turkey. Well, you don't know about that. But he was in Asia Minor, and he kept hitting walls. And then the, there was a vision and a dream that said, go over to Macedonia. And so he did. And, you know, Philippi, godless place that it is, there wasn't even a synagogue there for him to be able to go and start teaching. So he actually met this woman. He met Lydia down at a place of prayer. And she believed. And then more people believed. And then but the next thing you know, Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. <sighs> And we thought it was over at that point. We prayed, and they were praying too. You know, at midnight, they were praying and singing hymns in prison. You know what happened? There was a huge earthquake, and the prison walls were shaking. The chains came free. The doors flew open. And what did Paul and Silas do? Just hightailed it out of there to the next city? No. They stayed. They ministered to the jailer, he, and he and his whole family came to faith. Now, you can imagine that when morning came, the authorities were not very happy. In fact, I think they were probably more, probably more scared than anything. So they asked Paul and Silas and friends to, to go along, and we, we wanted them to go forward. We wanted the gospel to go forward, so we'd send money and, our, and, and other things to help them along the way. And so it was Philippi and Thessalonica, Thessalonica and Athens, Corinth. The gospel was, was bearing fruit everywhere, and we, these a couple dozen folks in Philippi got to be a part of it. <sighs> now, it hasn't been easy, and plenty of times I get discouraged. Maybe you do too. But when I think about Jesus and what he did and talk to my brothers and sisters about the work that he's not just did in the past, but he's doing in us now, it changes everything. No matter what, I realize that I can do everything through Christ who gives me the strength to do it. Now, Epaphroditus is an example of one man who got caught up in the big overarching story, the big story of what God was doing all throughout history, the gospel going forward. And for Epaphroditus, it changed everything. It turned his life completely upside down. And I think the reality of this is that stories shape our lives in really profound ways, that we live out of the stories that we're believing in, and even we write stories for ourselves that we tell to others that help to get, put our small actions in a larger web of relationships and meaning. So let me just give you one very superficial example. Well, maybe not superficial, but um, we as a family decide, have started to buy our beef from local um, farmers. So we get them from kind of grass-fed farms, and so we can buy a quarter or a half a cow, and it's delicious. But what the interesting thing is about buying beef this way is, you know, when you go to the store, that you just see, like, it's like T-bone, and it'll tell you the price per pound or whatever. But you go on these websites of these different farms, and it isn't just, hey, here's how much our beef costs. It's pretty good. It's, this is a we are doing this for these larger purposes because we believe that we're trying to make the world a better place. This is more sustainable and healthy for the animals and healthy for those who eat. And there's, anyway, there's this big overarching story to beef. And I think what we see in that is that we all put our actions in a larger story. And it's those stories that fuel and shape our actions. And so the story that's the core of our life shapes what we do. Now, of course, that if you read the Bible, you know that it's all about story. It's all about a big story that's happening. Um, one of the places we see that talked about very clearly is the book of Acts. And if you read through the book of Acts, here are some of the high points. Or here are some of the summary statements along the way that help give the picture of this larger story that's happening. Chapter 6, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples increased rapidly. Chapter 12, the word of God continued to spread and flourish. 
Chapter 13, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Chapter 16, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Chapter 19, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. The the perspective of Acts, and indeed the perspective of Christians, is that history is moving in a linear direction to an end, that the gospel is growing. What may have started as a mustard seed or a grain of wheat or as a little bit of leaven and bread is growing and multiplying to be the story in the world, that that's the story beyond all stories that's happening, and it's what we're called to live into, of this kind of story. So, When we talk about going forward together, we're not talking about a building, we're not talking about number of people in in seats, we're not talking about all those other things which are valuable and helpful, but they're just small tools in the grand story of the gospel going forward. That that is our hope, that the gospel would go forward through our church. Now, so this is what this series is about. Um, And so we're going to start off in a kind of a personal anecdote that Paul gives at the beginning of Philippians, that as I mentioned, that he is in prison. And as you can imagine, this group of believers who cares deeply about him wants to know why, wants to know if he's okay, wants, is probably asking, can his ministry still go forward even though he's in prison? Because last time he was in prison with us, it was like 12 hours and done, and there was that huge earthquake thing, right? Why isn't the same thing happening now? So they were starting to get discouraged. And, I, and the, the message that Paul gives them is that the gospel is going forward, that we're called to move forward together no matter what. No matter what the circumstances say, the gospel is going forward, and we're called to live into that history and story. So uh, that's where we're going to dive in. Uh, We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. So if you have a Bible or device, that's a good place to plant. It'll be up on the screen as well. And keep all of this in mind about Paul's imprisonment, because he takes a very unique view about being imprisoned. Verse 12, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, i.e. this unjust, brutal, brutal, no end in sight imprisonment, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Those are jarring words to say. And this isn't just hopeful optimism, hoping that he's going to get out soon, or hoping that, hey, it's not that bad because I've gotten to work on some of my writing. That he is saying that in the midst of all of these hard situations, that there is good going on, and he's living into that good. And he mentions two specific ways that the gospel is advancing. First, in verse 13, he says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So more than likely, as I said, Paul's, um, Paul's imprisonment was in Rome. And if he was in Rome, that this gave him a chance to spread the gospel to a lot of people who might not have heard before, that his imprisonment was almost like a Trojan horse, allowing him to get in, to be able to get um, undetected and have a platform to speak of Christ. Now, as an aside, we should never compare our jobs or neighborhoods or other things to Paul's imprisonment. That our jobs are not prisons in the way that Paul says prison. Our neighborhoods are not prisons in the way that Paul... But in the same way that Paul, that Paul was convinced that, this, that in this space, this unideal space, that God could still work and the gospel could still go forward, he was committed to it. And the way that Paul did that, his, his manner was that he believed that his chains were for Christ. So just to unpack this, I think what that means is that it was clear to others that he wasn't just in prison because he was a political dissident or a criminal. You know, at minimum, he was showing himself to be upstanding. But on the other hand, I think that what Paul is trying to tell us is that he probably had opportunities to renounce the faith and go free. If he would have said, you're right, that whole Jesus stuff, let's push to the side, he probably could have gone free. And so because he was in chains for Christ, it was clear to everyone around him that he was upstanding, that he'd done nothing wrong, but also that he was unwilling to give up proclaiming Jesus. And that's what he, I think he means, that his chains were for Christ. Now, if you, it may come to mind that there's someone else who is in prison unjustly, suffering, um, and preaching the kingdom no matter what, 
answers Jesus, of course. Um, but the, so what, I think what this is, Paul is showing us is that gospel proclamation and gospel behavior go together. It is because of the way that he acted that he was able to preach and for his message to be heard. That's how it's true for all of us. That it isn't just, I just need to say the words and not worry about it, or I just need to live a certain way and hope that people get it, is those things go together. They're mutually reinf- reinf- reinforcing. Word and deed go together. So here's the second way that Paul sees God at work. He says in verse 14, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. So do you hear what Paul's saying here? It's not just that the gospel is going forward inside the prison, but the gospel is going forward outside the prison because he's there. That others have uh, more confidence and joy in sharing the gospel around him. And that, that's a beautiful thing. That, and I think we see it in, true in our own lives, is that when we suffer or sacrifice in a way that exalts Jesus, that it gives others more confidence and encouragement to do the same thing. So, but reading between the lines, and we're going to cover this in, in a few in additional sermons, is that I think Paul's trying to encourage the Philippians. He's trying to tell them, hey, look, that I know that life is hard for you where it is. It's hard for me too. But the gospel's still going forward. And I want you to have more confidence and boldness not to be discouraged just because the culture is not going your way. He doesn't want the, their position in society, their honor, to be the scorecard they use, but he wants the gospel and it's going forward to be the scorecard they use. So continuing on, Paul addresses another challenge that is probably going on for him and, and for the Philippians. He says in verse 15, Now, it's also true, because he's talking about the gospel going forward, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. There are two approaches here. Some envy, rivalry, others goodwill. The latter, those who preach out of goodwill, do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, out of envy, the ones who preach out of envy and rivalry, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me, while I'm in chains. Now, this kind of makes, like, what? Huh? What's, so let me try to unpack, I think, what Paul's saying, because I think it has relevance to what we're in today. Uh, so first is that these, so there are two camps of preachers, and Paul's saying that, all right, that what I care about is the gospel going forward, and there's some that do it out of goodwill, there's some that do it out of rivalry. So first, I think the thing is that what is it? What's happening is that both are preaching Christ, but some have additional motives attached to it. Does that make sense? So they're both preaching the message of Christ. This isn't a true gospel, false gospel. It is both true gospels, but some, their behavior is not lining up. So whatever differences they have, they're not over an essential doctrine. So uh, two years ago, we talked about Galatians, and Paul is adamant about preachers who are preaching differently, that they're preaching another gospel. I don't think the same thing is happening here. Uh, The second thing I think we can figure out is Paul's talking about um, people who are near his imprisonment. So not people in Philippi, but people near him. And so I don't think that these people are trying to steal sheep from Paul's, uh, the churches he planted, but they're, they're merely trying to say, look, Paul has these weird teachings. That's probably why he's in prison. You need to think differently. I think that's kind of the thing going on. They're not trying to steal sheep, but as they share the gospel, that they're trying to correct what they think some of Paul's issues are. Um, And and following, I think that these other preachers aren't um, fake Christians. I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't attractive to be a Christian in the first century Roman world, so they're not just posturing to be Christians, hopefully to get things better for themselves, but they're genuine Christians who just have envy and rivalry that's part of their motivation. Now, what does this mean for us? Imagine that if Restoration Church, as we start talking about friends and neighbors, we started saying this, stuff like this. Hey, here's some good news. Jesus died for your sins, and he he rose again, and he really wants you to have a relationship with him. And you know what? (sighs) There are these other churches that they're kind of skewed on what they're going to tell you about how God made the world. And they're kind of skewed about all those other things about how Jesus is going to return. We know the right way. You cannot join them. You need to join us. Now, do you see what happened there? Is that it was the clear message, but it was done with envy and rivalry being a part of it, of trying to posture and push ourselves forward so that people might come to us. Now, church is not a market. 
It might seem like it is. There might be people, but church is not, we're, we're, the goal isn't to have a larger market share in church. Church is about the gospel going forward. And so that we're not, we're seeking not to be people who preach Christ out of envy or rivalry, but out of goodwill. Longing that people would join and be a part of God's kingdom wherever that's going to be, that it would grow in all of those places. So again, being forward together isn't saying, how do we move Restoration Church forward together? It's how does the gospel go forward? And then how is Restoration Church, do we get to be a part of that? This is Paul's conclusion, what he says at the end of it. And notice his largeness of heart and just his genuine um, confidence. He says, but what does all this matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. It's Paul's radical gospel focus on life that allows him to see the non-ideal, the wrong, the bad, and not get hung up on them. It is our gospel focus that will enable us to see the bad, the skewed, the not the way it's supposed to be stuff in the world and care about them and name them as wrong and name them as unjust and name them as things that we shouldn't celebrate and we cannot support, but also to not get hung up on these things, to be able to move forward with the gospel as our central focus. In some ways, it allows us to be able to say, you know what, all these other things over here, They're important, but at the end, they're going to go back in the box. They're going to be put away, that they will not endure, but the gospel will. So two closing thoughts about this. The first is tied directly to our church. The second, to the faithfulness of God. Uh, First, as I said from the beginning, that the main call and directive of Philippians comes in 127. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So for us, part of the way that we do this as one so that we can reflect the unity of Christ to the world is by having focused mission together and being in alignment in our mission. And as a reminder that our church's mission is this, with love, we embrace life together as we multiply deeper relationships in Christ. So over the coming week, we're going to be talking specifically about this mission and how it plays out in our church. The second thing is this, and don't, don't miss Paul's heart as we're in this series and as we're reading this letter, and you'll see it all over the place when you read through the, the letter. He says this in verses 5 and 6, and this, I think, echoes the way I know that our leadership feels about our church, um, how I feel, Um, And I hopefully that this is the kind of attitude that grips us and that shapes us as well. Paul says this in verse 5, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion until the day of Christ. Or we'll carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. So our confidence, our hope, is God's work, his doing, his promises. And that is what we're going to move forward together in. So in light of that, let's pray. God, we ask you that you would help us to move forward together as a church, as gospel people for your name's sake. God, would you, would you move forward? Would you help us to align ourselves to be most effective for your kingdom and we would keep the gospel fixed in our mind every day, have our attitudes and hearts shaped by it. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
working all things out things in closing. Uh, first, just kind of unprompted, this, this service will be on Facebook Live or on YouTube for in perpetuity. This would be a great service to go back and listen to. Um, one of the reasons is because we have the really talented musicians that we have. Um, so a special thanks for, for the guests who are here. Um, like we take it as a great honor when guests join us to be able to, to be part of our our music, and it's just, it's a joy. But the other reason to go back and listen to this service is because this song list is a great sort of, I don't know, theme for Philippians. Like these, these songs just tie into the rich themes that we're going to be talking about. So go back and listen to it. Skip over the sermon. Go back to, to the songs, and it's great. Uh, the last thing, the other things to say is that if you are visiting, you think, man, I would love to find out more about Restoration Church. What, what are they about? What's what their deal? Or here's this question I have. Uh, once a month that we have, we're, we're starting back off, uh, a class is way too official, just an inf- informal chat session called First Steps. And it's where you get to learn about um, what we're about as a church. So it's 30 minutes at 11 o'clock on Zoom on Sunday. So if you're yeah, 11 o'clock on Zoom. There's a link to it on the website homepage, and if you found a way to be a part of us, you can surely find our homepage as well. Uh, yeah, I would love for you to join us. Any, any questions? The second thing is keep on your calendars April 24th for our serve day at our new space. We're going to be seeking to bless our neighbors' projects for all ages uh, and ability levels. It's going to be a great chance to be together, but also to clean up and, and love our neighbors and just you know, show what we seek to be about. So, in light of that, between now and then, so in the next couple of weeks, live this. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always devote yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know, deep down, you know deep down that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So go in the power of God. Amen.